The Dharma, incomparably profound and exquisite, is rarely met with even in hundreds of thousands of millions of kalpas. We now can see it, hear it, accept and hold it. May we realize the true mind of the Tathagata. Today is the first day of this rather unusual um, session here in February of 2020 at Mountain Gate. Uh, circumstances are uh, requiring that the session be cut short, but nonetheless, perhaps we can make it deeper and stronger as a result of that shortening. It's amazing what human beings can do when they choose to do it, when they put their minds to it. One example of this is is a friend of mine a long time ago when he was in high school, was riding around with a bunch of other buddies in a car and the car flipped and uh, he was thrown out and his buddy was trapped under the car, but he was able to lift up the car and get his buddy out or his buddy was able to crawl out, or somebody else was able to get his buddy out. I don't know what the exact details were of the situation, but he was able to lift up the car and make that possible. <clears throat> and there are stories of other people lifting up cars to get them off injured uh, accident victims. That's a lot. A, a car weighs or can weigh uh, a couple thousand pounds, 3,000 pounds. That's not the normal amount of weight a human being is known to be able to lift in general, but under those extreme circumstances, something comes forth and a person is able to do things that ordinarily wouldn't be able to be done otherwise. When it's really, really, really super important for us to do the practice to truly reach awakening, if we are deeply motivated, we're willing to go beyond all obstacles, perceived obstacles, and accomplish it rather fast. Um, that said, it's it's not that advantageous to come to awakening really fast because there's a lot of groundwork that needs to be laid down for it to be uh, functioning in our daily life on a regular basis. And as we take time to uh, break through, and this is not this is not a recommendation to taking whatever time you feel like you want to take. Uh, we work at it uh, persistently. We work at it with our, our deepest dedication to open to that mind state, that way of being that is built in, that is free of hindrances. Hindrances that are normally brought up by our own inner thought processes, our own habit patterns, our own conditioning. It is, it is amazing what is possible. Many, many, many years ago, something around 60 or slightly less than 60 years ago, there was a little boy born in Southern California. And when he was young enough to still be in a crib, he was lying there with his feet up in the air as babies do, and he found himself wondering, whose legs are those? Where did this little body come from? Who am I? And he continued to wonder about that deeply as uh, the next year or two or three went by. And when he, when he was either four or five years old, he suddenly realized that he was perfect just as he was. And there was an inherent level of freedom in that because despite the fact that he grew up in a quite dysfunctional family and was subjected to physical and emotional abuse on, by both his parents, 
and that he had to deal when his when he was 17 with both his parents ending up in federal prison for dealing drugs, actually transporting them across the Mexican border. Uh, he, he still had some, some level of freedom from what does grip most people, habit patterns of assumptions about ourselves, uh, dysfunctional behavior, and so on. And as an example of this, when he was about 18, he was walking along the beach with some of his buddies. And as this happens among young teenage men, uh, another group of guys came along and shoved him, bumped his shoulder, I think it was. And his, his buddies was, were egging him on, saying, go get him, go get him. His response why? That in itself is an expression of a level of let go that is remarkable, particularly under the circumstances he grew up in. Eventually, he found his way to Zen practice, and initially, he was uh, characterized by some roughness in speech. He was a little bit loud. Uh, he was a big guy, and so some of the women in the group felt threatened by him. In fact, two threatened to quit if he wasn't dumped. But there was something that was much clearer to me about this young man. He had a deep level of compassion, a kind of innocence, an openness that came, I'm sure, as a result of that early, early childhood awakening experience, which must have been deep because it still functioned even when he was in his 40s. This is something each one of us can open to. Each one of us has this ability built in to perceive the world in a more clear and unhampered way. In the last couple of sessions, you've been hearing the, the Teishos on on the role of the different hemispheres of the brain. We're born, generally speaking, most of us are born with two hemispheres, a left and a right hemisphere. And they, they are somewhat specialized in their roles. The left hemisphere, according to this man who wrote the book, No Self, No Problem, uh, the left brain is the seat of... Uh, Pattern making, not pattern making, pattern understanding, pattern comprehension of language, which includes thought and speech, and an ability to read, read and uh, learn how to write too. The right brain has a more global view, and while it understands speech, it does not have the ability to speech, to create speech. And this professor who wrote the book speaks of uh, the experience of a, of a woman who is a neuroscientist who many, many years ago at this point, probably 12, 14 years ago, um, had a massive stroke that took her left brain offline. And it was an uh, amazing experience for her uh, particularly as a scientist, and particularly a scientist who was a brain scientist, who was whose whole career was spent mapping, or I should say up until then, was spent mapping, mapping the areas of the brain and, and what they were responsible for. And she had this amazing stroke, which she initially would, uh, as the stroke was taking place, uh, was going in and out of the results of, and uh, it did take her eight years to recover from that stroke. 
it did, and she did recover, which is a miracle in itself. And according to uh, uh, a neurologist who commented on her experience, um, she had a particular kind of stroke that would have made it easier to recover from, given that she got immediate attention. And for all of you out there who are potential recipients of stroke or experiencers of stroke, it is important immediately to seek attention because uh, there are medications that can be given within a very short window of opportunity, which can reverse the results of a stroke. Perhaps that's what happened to her. Uh, she was not able to speak in the stroke, but she was able, through great effort, to um, putting a call through to a colleague of hers who understand who it was coming from and was able to get help. This right hemisphere of ours seems to take a much bigger picture or open to a much bigger picture of reality. And it is perhaps through this side of the brain that we come to awakening. But then, of course, as history has taught us again and again and again, and Zen masters have encouraged us again and again, it has to be, what we realize has to be integrated into our daily life of speech, thought, and understanding of patterns. But when one has some level of opening to the true nature of reality, is what is called traditionally, then it is easier to do that. We can try to change our habit patterns. We can try to uh, open to more compassion and wisdom. Transcendental wisdom is what I'm talking about here, not book learning. But it is a long uphill haul. When I was nine years old in sixth grade, I remember sitting in desperation at my desk in my bedroom in Cleveland Heights, Ohio, in anguish because I had been trying since I was six to change certain habit patterns of mine that I felt were not ideal, not most compassionate. And I had so far failed. Of course, we know a lot more now about how to change patterns, but, but nonetheless, that is an example of how difficult it is without having some deeper insight into the nature of reality to change our habit patterns. As we go along deepening our practice, as I mentioned in the beginning, it is important to not have some kind of awakening too soon because there's a lot of groundwork laid in the process of all that Zazen we do and all those smaller insights that we open to that makes it much more solid when we do have an awakening experience. And moreover, we need to have some way of uh, keeping it deepening, of keeping it alive. Because it's important not just to sit back and kind of hang out in the, the happiness or joy of, or the ego, ego trip for that matter, if it's too, too small a, of, a, of an opening, there will be ego tripping. Uh, it's important not to sit back on our laurels and rest. It's important to keep on going because it's only a beginning. You've heard many times in these Teisho how having a Kensho, even if it's a really deep one, is just a beginning because there are lifetimes of challenging habit patterns that are still in place, weakened, of course, but still in place, that have to be open to and let go of in order for our behavior to 
exemplify what we have realized in our uh, Kensho experience. And remember the Kensho only means seeing into the nature of reality to a certain point. It's not a 100% job. And even if it were, it still doesn't bring us to an awareness immediately of every single place we're caught. That's something that unfolds in time. And it is also something that has to be worked on if we are truly to, as I said, exemplify this awakening experience. The Buddha had one great awakening experience that we know of in his lifetime. This young man, Siddhartha Gautama. But as he was entering into deeper and deeper meditation states during his sashin, he began to uh, awaken to lifetimes, his own lifetimes in the past, where he had been working on himself, working on those negative habit patterns, working on letting go greed, anger, and delusion, working on opening increasingly to compassion. And so we could just say really that that, that great Kensho experience, that Satori experience, that awakening experience that he experienced in that final lifetime that we are taught about was only the culmination of all those previous lifetimes of working on on that spiritual practice. At a certain point, rather than feeling daunted by the um, vast amount of work that is to be done to become as awakened as the Buddha was, it's important to realize it's a work in prog progress and that Holy Toledo, we're already on the path. We've actually discovered the path in this life, or rediscovered it, most likely. And we are increasingly deeply working on it, increasingly deeply opening to that profound beingness of the universe that we are. And as we persist, it will continue to open. Yes, there are ups and downs. Yes, there are faster and slower paces of, of going. It's, it's almost as if it's uh, similar to when I was swimming in a lake one time many, many years ago. And uh, what was interesting about swimming in that lake was the fact that it, I seemed to be swimming through different bands of temperatures of water. I'd swim through a cooler section, and then there would be a warmer a warmer section that I would suddenly enter into and cool and warm and cool and warm. There must have been a spring somewhere, I would assume, that was causing that kind of a, an experience. But it's a little bit like that with Zen practice too. This is why faith is so vital. If we maintain our faith that we can do it and our, our dogged Persistence, which is another important aspect of practice, that, that then we will be guaranteed eventually to open to this amazingness of humanity that we are and to open the qualities of compassion that we saw in this young man in Southern California. This level of such let go -ness that even when he was uh, encountered by this other group of teenage men and challenged by that bump on the shoulder, he saw no reason to react. It wasn't out of fear. This, this guy was big. Uh, he just saw no reason to, to get into a fight. How many, how many teenage boys would have been like that?
And as I said, his innate compassion was more and more evident the longer he was with us. And hearing stories about his childhood, it was, it was definitely ramped up then as well. Compassion is innate in all human beings unless we are uh, raised to become uh, psychopaths or sociopaths. But often it is uh, culturally limited because of the conditioning of our culture. For some people, there is an ability to be courageous enough to buck the system and show that compassion regardless. But it's built in and it can be uncovered more and more completely with increasing Zazen. As can this innate freedom, an awareness of this innate perfection, an awareness of this no-selfness that was uh, the title of that book, No Self, No Problem. We have huge potential in our practice, enormous potential in our practice. And the more deeply we go into it, the more we uncover increasing courage, increasing openness, increasing compassion, increasing life with a capital L. and are more and more able to offer what we can in this life for the benefit of all beings. I think that's enough for today. Thank you for listening. We'll stop now and recite the four vows. Oh, wait a minute. I'm going to do one more thing, and that is to share with you the death poem of a Zen master. This is Ungo Kiyo, who died on the eighth day of the eighth month in 1659 at the age of 77. And his death poem was, I came into the world after Buddha. I leave the world before Miroku, between the Buddha the beginning and the Buddha the end. I'm not born. I do not die. Miroku is the Buddha of the future. And of course, we know that uh, the person known as the Buddha uh, happened more than 2,500 years ago. And that was still considerably longer ago than before 1659 when Ungo died. And he seemed to have some inclination or intuition, I should say, that he was going to die. Uh, it is written here in this book, Japanese Death Poems, written by Zen monks and haiku poets on the verge of death, uh, compiled with an introduction and commentary by Joel Hoffman. On the first day of the eighth month, 1659, Ungo shut himself up in his room and prepared for the end. On the eighth day, he emerged and gave a sealed envelope to a monk who attended him. He then called his pupils together and preached to them one final time. In the middle of his sermon, exactly at noon, he died. When his pupils opened the envelope, they found his last words. And then there's a note here also. The historical Buddha is Gautama Siddhartha, who lived in the 6th to the 5th centuries BC. And he was also called Shakyamuni, the sage from the Shakya clan, the founder of Buddhism. Miroku, whose uh, name in Sanskrit is Maitreya, is the name of a mythical Buddha who is seated in the heavens and who will in the last days, which is 5,670,000,000 years after Shakyamuni's death, inherit the place now occupied by the historical Buddha. These two personages mark the beginning and end of the historical time. Ungo does not deny his own existence in time as a person who was born 
who lived in a certain period and who died. But, quote, I am not born, I do not die, quote, quote. He indicates the level at which his consciousness dwells. Um, I'm not sure I would go for that. Who Ungo really is, is beyond life, beyond death. Who you are, who I am, is beyond life, beyond death. Eternally transforming, never dying. Realize it. And thank you for listening again. And take now and recite the four vows.